Hey everyone, long time no see. I know it's been just over a year now since I posted my last video, but hey, in my defense. Anyways, Vlantis and I decided to make a buying guide for the NES since it was my first retro console. There's a lot of information that I wish I knew ahead of time before really getting into collecting, and that's what I'd like to discuss with you all. We're going to keep this video simple and straight to the point so everyone gets something out of this. Hey guys, so basically we're just going to give a quick breakdown of a couple ways you could get into collecting for the console that transformed Nintendo into the household name we all know and love. This includes stuff like the hardware, the accessories, some underrated games, imports, and some alternative options. Anyways, let's jump right in. Alright, let's get the basic console out of the way. The original Nintendo that we all know and love today typically looks like this model, because this was the first variant of the NES. Compared to the other models, this one is by far the most common. It was quietly launched in small batches in New York City in October of 1985, and with its success, launched nationwide in 1986. Selling roughly 62 million units worldwide, this over doubled the sales of the then massively popular Atari 2600. When buying this console, the vast majority of them still work today. However, you must keep an eye on the pin connector. Due to its front-loading design, this caused the pin connector, the part that the cartridge connects to inside the console, to get warped and bent until it begins to malfunction. With an old pin connector, you may need to wiggle the cartridge left and right and keep resetting until it begins to work. Over the years I've owned this console, this is what I find works best. Replacing a pin connector isn't too big of an issue, however, and it's also quite cheap finding a replacement one. The console supports composite AV output, yet only outputs sound in mono. This is the least expensive way to own an original NES due to how many there are. The NES Top Loader came to the States in late 1993 to try to prolong the inevitable replacement of the NES by the all-new Super Nintendo. However, the Top Loader went relatively unnoticed, which led to it becoming pretty uncommon, meaning higher prices in the collecting world today, typically selling for around $100. While the top loading design of the console was typically more reliable than the front loading toaster model, the top loader was only capable of outputting RF video, which was not as good as the toaster's AV output. While you could mod the system to get AV output, it is not an easy task, and buying an already modded console could cost you a pretty penny. Another main problem with the top loader is the noticeable jail bars across the screen while you're playing the game which really takes away from the experience. While not the best option, if you have spare change for a modded top loader to fix these quirks, I would definitely recommend it. Despite the system being able to play unlicensed games as well as just being more reliable overall, the top loader is still considered inferior to the original NES. If you have the money, the Japanese version of the top loader is my personal recommendation. The AV Famicom, which is what I'll be calling it from here on, is what the American top loader should have been. Releasing in late 1993, over a decade after the original Famicom's launch, the two look roughly the same, but the Japanese version is flat on the top, which was done in order for it to remain compatible with the Famicom disk system and its library of games. This version of the console does support full AV composite output compared to the American version's RF, resulting in a superior video quality. Also, the jail bar effect is not apparent in the AV Famicom, so overall the picture looks significantly better. An AV Famicom will run you just about as much as the American version, but I'm very glad to own this one, as I find it to be the best overall version. Some things to note, however, are the fact that you need a converter to play US games on the system, as the pin connectors between the US and Japanese versions of the games don't match up. Converters can be found on eBay quite easily and aren't usually that pricey. Also, I've noticed two games of mine that don't work on the system with the converter, which are Castlevania 3 and Metroid. You may unfortunately have to get the Japanese versions of the games to make them run on this setup. Also, keep in mind that you can play any imports with console, although that's kind of obvious. Overall, I highly recommend this version for the NES for anyone who's looking to get into collecting the system. Regardless, I would only truly suggest these three models of the console to use depending on your preference. Quickly getting accessories out of the way, there are two main controllers to choose from. There's the original boxy NES controller, which is sturdy yet comfortable, and there's a remodeled version meant for the top loader dubbed the dog bone controller for its shape. This version is the same, yet much more rounded, and the buttons are angled, otherwise they function the same. It's up to personal preference whether you like the classic controller versus the dog bone, but personally, we prefer the feel of the dog bone. Now we have the NES Max. There's a reason why they're so cheap to buy, which is because they're absolute garbage. Everything about it is fine and dandy, except for the mess that is the control pad. The disc to change directions doesn't center, and it's horribly unresponsive, not to mention the sound it makes. We advise you to just use a regular controller. 
the NES Advantage is actually quite nice. With its metal composure, rapid fire toggle, and a decent joystick, it works really well for arcade games but isn't really necessary. Can't forget about the power pad which works with world class track meet if you want your 30 year old console to get you in shape. They're cheap and pretty fun. Finally, no NES collection is complete without the speedboard and the rolling rocker. Finally, two accessories that just get me. Now we're going to quickly brush over some games that aren't mentioned too often that are still cheap and fun. We aren't going to talk a lot about the many classics of the console because we want to shed light on others that need more of a spotlight. Some of these classics, however, include the Super Mario Bros. Trilogy, Tetris, Zelda 1 and 2, Punch-Out, the Ninja Gaiden Trilogy, Metroid, the Mega Man series, Duck Hunt, Castlevania 1, Castlevania 3, Contra, Rad Racer, and Final Fantasy. Any of these games that I mentioned are all legendary and are all worth picking up. Now let's talk about some games that you may not have heard of before. Of the years of finding hidden gems for the system, these 15 games are my personal top recommendations that are all worth no more than around $20. Starting it off, we have Anticipation. You wouldn't expect a great time with a cover like that, but that's where you're wrong. Anticipation's kinda like a board game, sorta like Pictionary. It allows two players, and it won't run you over 5 or $10. For that price, it's really entertaining. The Adventure of Lolo is a cute puzzle game with a lot of charm, cute music, and an addicting style of gameplay. If you're interested as well, there are two sequels, equally as fun, yet they tend to run a little more expensive. Super C is the sequel of the classic Contra, and it's just as good as the original, with a fresh batch of levels, new power-ups, and additional top-down levels. The series is known for crazy difficulty and a sort of bullet hell kind of madness, but it's an easy game to burn stress away with at any given moment. Super C runs a bit cheaper than the original Contra, and many find it just as fun. Batman is a great platformer with tight controls, a brutal difficulty curve, and some of the best music to be found on the hardware. Punch your way through sewers and the city to deliver your knuckles to the Joker as well. There aren't too many RPGs on the NES, but Crystalis is a great one to own, with a memorable soundtrack, fast-paced gameplay, and a save system to keep your progress. Guardian Legend is a criminally underrated game, involving shoot 'em up segments mixed with top-down shooting segments, tied together with an unbelievable soundtrack. My only complaint, though, is the password system. I mean, what the hell is up with that? Jackal is another great co-op Konami game, where you control a jeep to single-handedly destroy an army. The jeep can turn on a dime, shoot a constant stream of bullets, and throw endless grenades at foes, and it's hectic fun. The thing I love about these old Nintendo titles is their attention to detail with realism. Journey to Silius is a tough side-scrolling game where you fight against a massive robot army in order to transport a floppy disk in the year 2373 in order to save humanity. Lighthearted fun. Oh yeah, look at this game's soundtrack because it's phenomenal. Kirby's Adventure was my first retro game of all time, and I still think it might be my favorite NES game. Coming out in 1993, this game fully utilized all the power the NES had to offer, giving an epic seven world journey on Kirby's second ever game. It was the first game to utilize Kirby's ability to change his form depending on what he swallows. The variety and grandiose that this game has to offer, not to mention the ability to save, makes this a top recommendation of mine. Guerrilla War is a crazy hectic game where you control a marine who plows his way through massive counterfire in order to provide independence to the nation. This game also supports two players and has a perfect difficulty curve, so have fun tearing through enemy forces with a friend. Cycross is a weird game. From what it seems, you race against other people driving mechanical motorbikes. Riders regularly die and commit vehicular manslaughter against one another, all in the name of good sport. There's something addicting to this game, though. It's pretty strange. For the sports fans who are sick of the newest Madden, the NES hooks you up with Tecmo Bowl. This football game is enjoyable even to those who don't really care for football. It's more of an arcade game than a simulation game, and the pace is intense. There is also a sequel called Tecmo Super Bowl on the NES that is perhaps even better, but the original game is still very cheap and common. Zexies is criminally underrated in my opinion. With a hypnotic soundtrack, memorable levels, and a password save system, this game is really fun and memorable. 
The title is probably why it went under the radar, but it's a great time with a mix of platforming and shoot 'em up. Battletoads is infamous for its difficulty spike by the third level, and it's criticized for that. But if you want to have a challenging brawler where you control toads named Rash, Zitz, and Pimple, this game is really well designed. The four levels that I managed to get to were really fun to me, but even I couldn't make it that far into the game. I wouldn't recommend it to people who are new to platformers, though. Finally, we have Ice Hockey, which is another arcade-like sports game where you pick a team of four guys who you pick are either fat, normal, or twigs. Their build varies how they feel in the game, and it's fun to even those who don't like hockey like myself. With all these games mentioned, we need to point out that there are a lot of Japanese exclusives that were never brought to the States. Some of our favorite imports include Kid Dracula, Nuts and Milk, Crisis Force, Devil World, Holy Diver, Mother, and Final Fantasy 2 and 3. You can either import these games and set up the console to play them, or potentially find English reproductions of them on websites such as eBay or Etsy in order to have copies that work on your North American console. Oh, alright, now that we have a time to catch our breaths, there's just one last factor of collecting that I want to mention as well, that provides an alternative on how to play the games. Nintendo released what they called the NES Classic in 2016, which included all the games shown in this list, all built in one miniature NES console that supports HDMI output. If you want to be able to play these games on a newer TV rather than the old tube TV, it's something worth checking out. Unfortunately, the NES Classic is quite uncommon as of now. Nintendo didn't make nearly enough systems for the demand, and due to this, it may be hard to find one. If you want the authentic feeling of playing these games, though, it's probably best to stick with the real hardware. And that should just about do it to wrap up our advice on collecting for the NES. It's obvious why the NES is so popular to collect for due to the fact that it's quite cheap and fun, not to mention the fact that there are so many good games, way too many to be able to talk about in this video. So we apologize if we left out any games that you wanted us to cover. There are many videos on YouTube that talk about the great games on this system, so listen to what other people have to say too, not just us. Anyways, Blontis and I hope you enjoyed the video, and we hope you gained some insight of the NES if you were thinking about snagging one. Again, I'm truly sorry for the long wait between videos. College has been taking a lot of our time, but I hope to have another video up soon. If you have any ideas, I'd love to know. Leave a comment down below, and I'll answer. If you're so inclined to leave a like on this video, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. It goes a long way. Take care and happy collecting.